Spence, you want to give it another couple of minutes? Up to you. I've got the recording going, so we can start whenever. I'll just give out my quick spiel about muting and such um, whenever whenever you're ready. What do you think? I am ready anytime. Okay. Then I'll give my spiel now. Um, just, uh, you know, if you're not talking, uh, try to keep yourself on mute. Feel free to unmute, raise your hand, ask questions, or drop questions in the chat, and I'll try to direct Glenn towards that if he doesn't see it. Um, and if I'm hearing a lot of background noise, then I'll, I'll mute people as needed to try to make the audio tolerable. Um, that's it for me. So go ahead, Glenn. Feel free to take it away whenever you like. Thanks very much, Spence. I think people are probably in the last session uh, talking about special purpose tools. And uh, me personally, I've started to use all-purpose flower for everything. So here we go with miniature kites. And uh, here's my outline. I'm going to show some miniature kite examples. And um, I have a little bit to show about uh, techniques as well. Then I have two builds. The first build is a miniature pear top kite. And the second build is a doodle kite. Both uh, kites are of my own design. And then a quick slide to show you my book because I have a book about building miniature kites. So miniature kites uh, are often quick to build. That's one of their advantages. And one of the things that they're great for is doing something quick with kids. So if you've ever thought about uh, going to a classroom, going to a camp, uh, going to a gathering of friends, you can bring a small box of materials and generate a lot of fun with, uh, with kites that really fly. Um, I mentioned on the slide right there Thanksgiving because one of the, our traditions at home is that every Thanksgiving when we get together, um, I build kites with the kids. And that has been going on for, I'd say, more than 10 years and each year I do something different. Uh, but uh, lately the kids have been grow growing up and I've been doing bigger projects uh, after Thanksgiving dinner, but uh, it's something that they say that they actually look forward to. So here's a miniature kite. This is a Hargrave. <laughs> and uh, that was it zooming around the room and I got it exactly toward the camera. So um, let me talk a little bit about miniature kite styles because miniature kites really run the gamut of all kinds of kite styles. Um, a lot of miniature kites are little kites for kids. And when I do workshops, the parents usually push in the kids, even if I have a, a complicated design that would be difficult for kids with little hands with lack of motor skills uh, but they still assume that miniature kites are for kids, and that's not always the kite, the, 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 uh, the situation. Uh, miniature kites can be reproductions of large kites, like a Cody kite. Uh, they can be tiny kites, like I have a tiny heart kite, um, and um, I'll show you one of my small or tiny kites later. And I differentiate between tiny kites and ultra lightweight kites because the two are very different. For a tiny kite, you're going for size. For ultra lightweight, you're not going for size. You can make something bigger, I mean, if, you know, a few inches, but you're uh, directly aiming at the weight of the kite and trying to chop the weight down wherever you can. Now, many miniatures are made for flying indoors, but there's also sort of a category of outdoor kites. So we could reproduce a kite and fly it indoors. We could re reproduce a kite and fly it outdoors. We might use different materials for those two situations. And I'll show you my uh, firecracker kite, which is made out of Tyvek and uh, flies beautifully outdoors. So as I said, uh, miniature kites are typically reproductions of historical kites, kites that fly at walking speed, kids' kites that are simple and easy to build, sometimes with very, very few materials, which is one of the ones I'll show you. Ultra tiny, ultra light gate, lightweight, and also beautiful and artistic. So uh, that's a, a nice category of, uh, of miniature kites. Now, I wanted to uh, start by talking about the materials for miniature kites. And 
I uh, appreciate the presentation that Donna did when I saw her presentation said miniature kites. I had to scramble to see whether I had accidentally uh, displayed one of my presentations because I thought it was me. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, I liked Donna's presentation and I agree with everything she'd done. She uh, did a beautiful job. And my, my first statement here is keep it light because lighter flies better. And I have four categories here, the spars to use, the adhesives to join them, the sails you want to use, and then what you might use for flying lines. So let me start with flying lines and say that for the most part, it really doesn't matter. I, I jokingly tell people that they should go into a sewing store and ask for the cheap stuff and they'll know what you mean. Because really, when you're flying a miniature kite, usually the, the thread is uh, going to be insignificant that will do for pretty much any kind of miniature kite. Now, if you're flying, uh, you know, uh, a larger, heavier one, you might want to use the first few, nylon, silk, th uh, cotton, polyester, rayon. Um, if you're doing something that's tiny, you might even go with something that's thinner, like human hair or spectra. Human hair is often done just um, to be cute. Um, it's something that you can grab and use and surprise somebody because you're, you're flying on human hair. Now, uh, for spars, um, we talked a lot about bamboo yesterday and splitting bamboo and shaving bamboo and sanding bamboo. We've talked about all that. Um, nylon fishing line is great. I have some nylon fishing line here, and it comes in different pound tests. And that is something that you'll judge based on the wingspan of the kite. What you might do is start with something that's around uh, like a 20 pound test for a kite that's about three inches. Um, I have, if you can still see my face, brush bristles. You can see how very, very thin those are. And since they're so thin, they're also very flexible. So for, um, for very small kites, if you want to add a spar, sometimes you don't need to, um, but for example, say that you made a hawk and the feathers need some support, you might use uh, brush bristles from a, uh, a three inch painting brush. And uh, that, that works really well. You'll, you know, if you take a few off, the brush won't even notice it. I often uh, build kites with balsa wood. Um, I've built some nice uh, kites with glass fiber and I have miles of glass fiber. So um, maybe, um, uh, I can trade with somebody if they want glass fiber. I could get a, a, a 0.9 millimeter uh, pencil for a trade. Um, carbon fiber I've used as well. Um, different diameters of carbon fi fiber work, and sometimes you can even peel it off of something that's broken. So if you have a, a broken spar, sometimes you'll see that they are tiny little uh, threads, but consistent and uh, uh, bend well. And one thing that I don't recommend is boron fiber, but for the ultra lightweight stuff, that's what I tend to use for the, the lightest weight kites. Now for adhesives, it really depends on what you're putting together. So for tissue paper and wood, uh, white glue, yellow glue, model cement are great. Uh, a spray glue is often very good, and that's really a water, I'm going to say, not water, but a spray glue is a rubber cement, and is nice because it gives a nice, fine, even coating, and uh, one of the techniques that I use is I will have a sort of a piece of paper on the floor, put the object to be sprayed, whether that's a spar or an entire frame at the center of the paper. And then I'll give a very light, very quick mist over the, uh, the whole deal. Then what I do is I touch left, right, up and down 
to see whether I actually hit the object in the center with the spray glue. And that way, I don't have to give a heavy mist. I don't have to go across it. I can uh, sort of effectively find out that I have gotten the whole thing. So um, let's see, that was rubber cement super glue. A lot of people um, like super glue. I, I don't tend to use it for miniature, glue, uh, miniature kites, um, but I have. Uh, heat is an example of something interesting because if you're making a plastic sail, you can actually bond the plastic together and melt it using a, a soldering iron rather than um, adding weight by using some kind of glue. So you're actually making the thing the same weight or possibly even lighter. Um, now let's see for sales. Um, tissue paper is great. There's lots of different tissue papers. I've shown a few in the um, picture right there. There's also rice paper, typing paper, wrapping tissue, uh, polyester fabric, plastic bags, and thin films. The thin films are on the boron fiber kind of scale of lightness. So the ones at the bottom, I may, might make a kite if I wanted it to be ultra, ultra lightweight with boron fiber, a thin film, and a very thin piece of spectra. Um, I've actually gone from spectra to using a 40 denier nylon, which I would be willing to give somebody if they want some, because the spectra was so thin and light, when I wanted to put the kite away, it was difficult to get the kite uh, thread back into the box so that I could close the box and go on and show somebody another demonstration. Um, let's see, next. Um, do you guys still hear me? Why doesn't somebody uh, pipe up and say something? David Butler has his hand raised, maybe. Uh, did you have a question, Dave? Uh, yeah, you were talking about uh, kite lines. And uh, one of the kite lines that I really like is um, a thread that they use for fly tying, because I used to tie flies a lot. And mm -hmm. for the ultralights that you would use the, the spectra on, here's two uh, threads. I'm not sure if you can see them very well. Let's see if I can put some paper behind them. The one on my right is uh, three aught, and the one on the left is eight aught. And I'm not sure you can even see the eight aught. Do you know the material? Because, for example, they might be very similar to the 40 denier nylon. What that nylon is used for mm -hmm. is actually weaving a thin, lightweight fabric. Yes. So you don't actually use this nylon as a thread. You use it as a basis for making thin fabric. Except that for fly tying, they actually do use this on a, a size 24 hook, which is minuscule. Uh -huh. um, the other one that was excellent, which was from Yoshi um, he took a silkworm cocoon where it had already been boiled, and he'd pull off a single strand until it broke. And then he'd pull off a second strand and then twist them together and keep on going. Uh -huh. And so when he has his world record miniature kites, they're being flown off of a single strand of silk. Not right. a single strand of silk, but a single strand of silk. And I'd expect that the spectra strands that I have would be equivalent to that. Um, and uh, sp spider silk is very strong, and so is the spectra. But at one point, you're kind of in a balance. Should it be easy to handle, or should it be very, very lightweight? And often, the, the balance there is you want to be able to handle it. And uh, people used to make um, airplanes out of a film that you would actually put shellac on water. The problem was they were so delicate that you couldn't handle them. And now they're using thicker films that are more durable. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to go on to some more uh, miniature techniques now. Um, the first is glue techniques, tape techniques, sail making techniques, framing your kite, some dihedral and bridle and tail, and then the flying lines, which we've, we've just talked about. But I'm not going to go through all these techniques today because they are all in the book about miniature kites. 
Um, the one that I wanted to focus on today is the one about dihedral techniques, because getting a miniature kite with a dihedral gives it the stability that you need in order to get it to fly. And there's a variety of techniques, so I thought I would step through um, a few of those. So here we go. One is to crease and fold the paper, which is what we're going to see today in the workshop. Another is taking a piece of wood, and you see that I have three nails in a board there, and I'm soaking that piece of wood and then drying it on that form. Another is to heat and cool a piece. The fourth one, curl up and die, is the name of a hair cutting salon in London. And I thought curl up and die was such a great name that I had to use it here because what you're doing is you're taking a piece of fishing line, curling it around a form, and then cooking it at uh, 200 degrees in a toaster oven for a short period of time. Um, I think maybe 10 minutes would be fine in order to give it um, a little bit more resistance to make it keep that curve. Um, flexing bristles, I did show you already the brush bristles that I took off a brush. These actually were interesting because they had a uh, gold and clear bristles on the same brush to, to give it kind of an interesting uh, look to the brush. Um, bracing a, um, a miniature kite using uh, like a leading edge here with a brace across. Um, I, I tend not to use a brace and let me tell you why. Um, I built a kite which I call the dragon kite and I have a picture of it in a minute. I'm going to show you a bunch of pictures of uh, miniature kites that I've built. But the dragon kite has a wooden spar as a dihedral. And then the center I left flexible so that it would flex on its own in the wind. Now, one thing that you could do would be to brace that with a, you know, a third spar. The problem is that then you would not get that flexing in the wind. And miniature kites they, um, um, how do I say that they tend to be more uh, finicky about the wind than many larger kites. So bracing, in my mind, makes the kite a little bit more specific to a certain wind speed, and that's probably why I don't like doing it. Tension lines I'll show you, breaking and re-gluing where you want to set a dihedral by using some bottle caps on the table and angling the, uh, the wood uh, that you're going to join uh, to get a proper dihedral on both sides. And slicing a bottle I'm going to show you. So let's start with the uh, simplest one, which is just to take some monofilament. This comes off the spool curved. In this case, this was, I think, 10 pound test but uh, I was recommending that you use something heavier than this. This, this, me looking at it, it looks a little bit thin, but it depends on the size. You know, if I was gonna make something maybe two inches wingspan, I might use this. If I was gonna make it maybe uh, four inches wingspan, I would use uh, a heavier uh, pound test uh, monofilament. Here is what I'm talking about, about using a sliced piece of plastic. Uh, this is, on the right-hand side, a plastic bottle. And it's one of the two-liter bottles that you get uh, soda uh, in. Once you drink the soda and wash the bottle, uh, you can usually cut it along the seam. And then cutting it um, along the circumference, you can get uh, strips like this one that are already pre-curved. And if you're careful, you can cut those strips very thin, or if you want more strength, you can cut them a little bit thicker. And these are what I use for making kids butterfly kites, because um, for the butterfly kite, what I'm doing is I'm using a piece of typing paper, also called copy paper, I'm using double-sided tape to stick this um, curved plastic piece onto the back. And I put the tape, the double-sided tape, on the back of these ahead of time so that the kids don't have to mess with glue, they don't have to mess with tape, 
They just have a spreader that they stick on and it automatically gives them the curve on their butterfly. Um, next, uh, here I have a lighter and what I've done is I've taken a piece of bamboo and uh, the bamboo that I have comes from a mat and was already colored red. So I thought it would show up pretty well in the picture. And what I did was I, I heated the bamboo, held it between my fingers and let it bend until I got what I felt like uh, was a proper bend in the bamboo. And then a, sec a second or two later, it cools and it holds that bend. Here's the brush bristles that I showed you the package of already twice. So here it is a third time. Uh, very thin, and these are the ones that I said are gold and clear. So you can actually pick off one and decide which, uh, which color you want. Now, here's another piece of bamboo. And um, if you use your fingernail against some materials, you can actually um, cause it to bend and hold the bend by just by kind of running your fingernail or um, a, a metal ruler uh, edge against the uh, bamboo to cause it to curve. And you might have to do that multiple times to get the curve that you want out of the bamboo. Um, another alternative is to uh, tension the bamboo and then run the uh, flame across it. What you could do is use a single candle to do that. And I had a third way, which was um, taking a piece of bamboo or um, I'm even thinking about the fishing line that we were talking about before and wrapping it around the form and then heating it. That way, the bamboo or fishing line takes the form of uh, what you've wrapped it around um, so that you get kind of the angle that you want and the material that you want that way. I, I like this one very much. Uh, this technique is using a piece of bamboo and think of that bamboo as being straight. It, I know there's a slight curve to it because I was messing with it. And what I did was I took the piece of bamboo, broke off a piece of that cool red bamboo and glued it on the end as a stopper. And then what I do is on the other end, I tie it around, I think I wrapped it around maybe five times, put a tiny drop of glue to hold the um, thread in place, and then I tied a loop at the opposite end. I measured carefully because the length of this tension line is going to cause me to get a bow of a certain depth like this. So um, I measured to get it, and all I have to do is hook that over the end, and I'm always going to get this bow. Now, the advantage there is if I have a plastic box like this, or I want to store it, what I can do is unhook it, the kite goes flat, and I can store it very easily. I'm not storing the, um, the bow under tension. Um, uh, another advantage to this is say that I wanted to increase the tension here. Now, for other techniques like the curved bamboo, I can't change that once it's fixed. For this technique, what I can do is unhook the loop so that I'm back to this situation here, wrap it around the right-hand side once, twice, three times, and then when I hook it around the other end again, I get a deeper bow than I did before. That allows me to adjust the kite for the current wind speed. So I, I thought that that was a, a, nice, a nice advantage. So here's my storage boxes for uh, wood that, and other materials. Uh, I sometimes for larger miniatures use basswood. Um, I usually strip my own balsa wood I have a good supply of um, mats that have kind of toothpick sized pieces of bamboo. Um, I like the thinnest that I can get. It's easy to add a second piece. It's often difficult to shave down a big piece into something that you like. Um, 
I thought I would ask whether there's any comments so far. I'm not seeing any uh, standing questions or hand raise, uh, hands raised at the moment, so I, I think you're probably good. Okay, I'm going to continue on then. Um, I thought I would show you some miniature kite examples. So I do a few workshops. These are some of my workshop kites. I mentioned this uh, butterfly kite because this is the one that has the curved piece of plastic bottle on the back. And... Um, I, I love this picture because the butterfly just happens to match her glasses. And uh, what I do is I give them uh, Sharpie pens so that they can de decorate their kites. It doesn't make them much heavier at all. And uh, the kites, as you can see this one, uh, fly pretty well. They're done using uh, trash bags cut into strips as a tail. I usually have four very thin bags, uh, very thin tails that come from a trash bag. And one of the nice things about buying trash bags is that right on the side of the box, they say the thickness in mills of the um, plastic material so that you can look and usually the cheapest bags have the thinnest, um, the cheapest boxes have the thinnest bags that make the thinnest and lightest tails. Here's a pebble kite on the right-hand side. It's not a rock, it's a smaller thing than a rock, so we call it a pebble. And I usually supply uh, templates so that they can put the piece of paper over the template, draw the outline, and get a beautifully finished uh, design very quickly and easily in um, kind of a workshop situation. Here is my dragon kite, and to create my dragon, um, these, these are three students that were at an artist's colony. And I don't know if you could tell, but one of them has a prosthetic leg, which I was very impressed by. Um, but back to the topic at hand, um, when I designed this uh, dragon kite, what I did was I came up with multiple designs for the tail, multiple designs for the head, and multiple designs for the wing. And then what I did was I chose my favorite designs and put them together into this dragon kite. And this dragon kite uh, does use a bamboo framework. And I did that at uh, MKS one year. We did this uh, project. The firecracker kite flies better than the dragon kite does. And one of the reasons is that the bridle is adjustable. I did what Donna was talking about with doing a um, prusik knot around a two-point bridle. The kite is made from Tyvek, and the bottom is a fuse. And if you could see at the very tip of the fuse at the bottom, I put some sparkly uh, mylar to make it look like the firecracker was lit. But um, the Tyvek being a kite that's about, I'd say, nine inches tall, uh, maybe... I'd say three inches wide, uh, fl flies very, very well. And the spine for it, I used carbon fiber. And the spreaders, I use those plastic strips again uh, to give the curve of the um, firecracker. Here's a mini bird on the left. I did a hundred of those in Florida, a Brazilian carapeta kite, which I never really got to fly well. I thought it was pretty heavy for its size and a little red dot kite, a tiny miniature competing for size. I've done uh, a few Cody variations. Uh, the one on the left, a Superman Cody, and you can see that I did a real stick and tissue construction for these. I'm using Japanese tissue paper, and it's nice because it comes in eight colors, and I'm able to get a very lightweight result. I, these are a little bit smaller, but my 10-inch Cody weighs, uh, the finished flying weight is about three-quarters of a gram. So um, if you take a dollar bill, you would have to cut off a piece of it to equal the weight of my 10-inch Cody. Here's what, one of the Hargraves that I made on the left and another Hargrave that I made on the right. Um, 
both both are great flyers. They fly faster than some others uh, because they're more tilted into the wind. But what that means is that they're great for flying outdoors because first of all, they're very lightweight, uh, the balsa wood and tissue paper. And this tissue paper, I had fun with the construction on the left because the uh, yellow um, kind of stripe there is actually from three pieces of tissue paper that are joined together and overlapped the same that way that you would do applique with fabric. Um, um, the red devil in the middle is uh, one of the more complicated kites that I ever tried in miniature. I'd say that the kite was probably about eight inches tall, but um, my idea behind that one was to have a front face, a back face, and a middle plane um, and still get it to fly. And it has a couple of keels on it. It uh, was in, definitely an interesting construction. And one of my hopes here is that I'm motivating you to try something yourself because there is so much that can be done. Pretty much any kite that you can think of can probably be repeated in miniature. On the left, uh, I did a set of miniature kites called Be a Friend of the Museum. And that's a bumblebee with a heart on it that I did for Valentine's Day originally. Um, the uh, antenna on the bees are brush bristles. The hawk in the middle uh, is uh, a great flyer that uh, went in an auction. And then the bat kites on the right hand side, actually, uh, I think one of them is this bat kite right here. Um, and I found the perfect box for it. It just fits. And this one is really a great flyer. Let me just uh, hold it up in front of the camera. The, um, the top spar is carbon fiber. The other spars, diagonal here and vertical spine, are also carbon fiber. The tail is magnetic recording tape and a beautiful flyer, partly due to the long tails and the lightweight Japanese tissue paper. Um, doesn't hurt, doesn't hurt, it flies, a, it's a great flyer, has a, uh, because it's bowed, it has a good amount of dihedral for stability. Here's some more. Um, I made the one on the left um, in uh, George's workshop, and uh, I made the kite and then painted it with uh, black ink. The one in the center, um, a lot of people love. I have it right here. I also found the perfect box for it. Um, <laughs> what, I, what I tell people is that uh, the reason that it fits in the box so well is because I had the box and I made the kite to fit in the box. So that's why it fits so well. The one on the right-hand side, the, the wave, is disappointing because the interesting thing about that kite is looking at it from the top because it's a double curve. Think of two curves on the side meeting a curve in the center. And that's the shape of the, uh, the kite when you look at it from the top. When you look at it from the front, I actually put vents uh, along the, um, the front face. That, I think, went to a museum in Japan. Some kabuki kites. I made a set of five. A ghost? Yes, go ahead. I can barely hear you. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me better now? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, how did you get th this? I'm sure that you pre-cut these holes into the tissue paper. How did you get it to stretch so taut? I mean, <laughs> so delicate. How did you get it to stretch taut without tearing the, these little edges? Well, um, I try to cheat as much as possible. And one of the things that I did with this one was I layered up four pieces of tissue paper uh, this is condenser paper. I forgot to mention that earlier. Condenser paper is lighter than Japanese tissue paper, which is lighter than American tissue paper, which is lighter than some other uh, like wrapping tissue thing, kinds of paper that are pre-printed. Pre -pre so think of me having four layers. And then what I did was I put a circle on top of it and cut out the circles in all, all four at once. 
cut out the uh, curves on the outside on all four at once. And then with the tissue paper on my working surface, I put long strips along from top to bottom, then another one along the width. And then I had to put little tiny pieces on the outside because everything had to be flat. So I glued those little tiny pieces into the corners. I hope you can see my pointer because I'm just going to point to the little extras that I put here and a little extra that I put there to get the whole thing completely flat. Then once I had all of the four sides built, then I finally joined the sides. So it's not a typical way of, uh, of building a kite. Um, so then, I, well, well, yeah, go ahead, Mitch. Did, did that answer your question, Mitch? Cool. There's a couple other questions in the chat real quick while we're, while we're kind of paused. Um, Let's go. Marcus asked, what is the diameter of the rods in the bats, presumably those, those carbon fiber rods in the, in the bats earlier? Um, I wish I had my uh, vernier caliper, but I'm going to say really thin. Um, what <laughs> could I compare it to? We're going to say as, as thin as a needle, um, and maybe that'll have to do about needle thickness. Cool. Um, uh in that case, really, just as thin as you possibly can get. Uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll hold it up against my finger so that you can see that they are tiny. And uh, when cool. John talked about, uh, John Trenopole talked about uh, carbon fiber, he said they're not selling the uh, point, I forgot how many zeros, but there's a one at the end. And he said they're not selling that anymore. That that was cool stuff, and that might be what I'm uh, what I'm seeing there. Uh, was there another question? Yeah, there's one more from Gordon Sievers about the the Cody kites you showed earlier. He asked, "What did you use for the Cody spars?" Oh, those are all balsa wood, and that was why I was able to get it so light. Um, I, my friend Yoshizumi San said I really should work in bamboo, and I do work in bamboo. Um, there's a cute little bamboo kite, and you can see the sticks on it. I didn't make this one, but the idea is the same, is that um, if I make it from bamboo, it comes out at one weight. If I make it from balsa wood, it comes out at another weight, much lighter. And I like the lightweight advantage, and I've sort of come to terms with the idea that it's more breakable um, if I'm careful with it. Like you'll see, here's one of my uh, little Cody um, kites. This is a Cody reproduction, more or less. And that's all done with bamboo, uh, balsa wood. And this probably also comes in at about a half a gram to three quarters of a gram. So less than the weight of a dollar bill. Maybe what I'll do is hold this one up out of the box. Right now, I've never touched a kite. And that's, I think, one of the important things is that I'm very careful about it. There, uh, I'm uh, giving a little a breath of air. But uh, I'm very careful about it because I feel that if I don't touch it, it's much m less likely to get broken. So I handle it by the thread. And sometimes I, I actually leave the thread outside of the box so that I can grab the thread and pull it out without uh, touching it again. How are we doing for questions? That was the last question in chat, but Dave Butler has his hand raised. Did you have a question, Dave? Uh, yes, I didn't pin uh, Glenn up uh, all by himself early enough, so I was holding, hoping you'd put the bat kite back up. Um, oh, so you just want to see it. I can do that. Yes. I want to see that upper spar. OK. Um, I can just hold it up like this. And again, this is carbon fiber. This is the back that you're looking at. And mm -hmm. I'm not worried about touching this one because it's all carbon with tissue paper. And the tails are uh, music recording tape. That's stuff that kids have no idea what it is. Is that I've never seen that before. Or dihedral in that, Glenn? 
Oh, yeah. I thought you could see that. I'm sorry. Let me hold it up one more time so you could see the dihedral. There's a, um, a thread, which is a tension line. Ah. And I think I'm using that loop technique uh, where I can wrap it and tension it more or less. Great. I'm glad you guys are interested. This is the kind of thing that I was hoping for, was that you would be interested enough for me to uh, show more detail. OK, so um, Kabuki kites, a little ghost, and a steampunk kite. So the steampunk kite never really flew very well, uh, maybe in heavier winds than I had that day. But what I did for the steampunk kite was I printed it using my laser printer. And that is printed on Icarex. Here's an X-wing that I built. This is after a guy in France who did one that's similar. Um, one of the cool things I found about that X-wing kite is that I can do an axle with it. It's this single line axle that um, I thought was kind of fun. Um, the one on the right is uh, a, a sword kite of my own design. Uh, flew really well, and I recently did something similar in a seven foot size. A hawk on the left, and I forgot the name of the one on the right. I must have come up with a name for it at some point, but it is uh, really tiny and uh, a little bit finicky, but I thought it was pretty cool. Maybe I called it a hummingbird. This uh, array on the left is made out of polyester fabric, and I designed it with a three-point bridle that you can see for flying outdoors, and it has a, a polyester loop tail the loop tail, I would say, must have been at least four feet. Um, you know, that makes it eight, an eight-foot loop, making it four feet long. Um, and those are all different colored polyester fabric pieces that I put onto carbon and then tensioned them with two tension lines. And the thing flew absolutely great until it broke one day, um, I think it got stepped on or something something terrible because the carbon broke right in the middle. And I did repair it, but after that, it didn't really fly as well as, uh, as it used to. The one on the right is a crossbreed tissue paper and balsa wood. The one that's on the left are some snowmen with, um, I think I made those with um, um, bamboo. And I made a set of them as prizes uh, at a certain festival. The one on the right is a Japanese family crest with uh, bamboo and tissue paper with a family, a Japanese family crest already printed on the tissue paper. I liked demonstrating that one for kids because I was able to point out that it has a big hole in the center, but it still flew very, very well um, because I sort of used that to bring out the fact that it's not how much fabric is missing, it's how much fabric you have there to generate lift. Here's uh, some of my miniature kite exhibits. I have one right here in my hands. There's an Edo kite, and this is a sunset that I painted using a uh, Sharpie markers. And uh, that's done on Icarus. Hey, Dave, I see you have your, go ahead. Can you hold that up again, please, Doug? Sure. And this is the same as the one that you should see on your screen right now. So, Glenn, I, I see that you're using the Japanese papers. Do you prefer the the more yellowish Gompi or Kozo or what? Which ones do you order? Um, the, the thing is, I don't really order anything because I have so much already. Um, I was afraid that somebody was going to say, you know, Glenn, where do you order from? And I would say that I have drawers full of stuff. So when I, when I need something, I, think, I look in the drawers to see what I have, and I use what I have to make something. So I, I have used Gampi. Um, this, for example, is um, Japanese tissue paper uh, that would be probably called Gampi. It comes in eight colors, and it's the same tissue paper that I used on this Hargrave here. But... For this dart uh, kite, I used an art paper, which made it kind of heavy, 
but uh, it's still flu. And one of the interesting things about this dart kite is that I put a keel on it right here to add stability. Um, so Dave, did I answer your question? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, Glenn? Um, the, uh, the Edo there was pre-printed and given to me. It might have come from Dan. I'm not sure if Dan's on the uh, on the on the uh, conference today. Maybe he could pipe up and say whether he gave it to me. Glenn, could I ask you something about the Hargrave? Sure. I, I see this beautiful little. It looks like a back cut applique on the front on the leading edge. Yes. Is that what that is? Did you actually glue in a, a separate piece of colored paper? That's exactly what it is, is I did applique with tissue paper. Um, I don't have one to show, but I think I once tiled something like 48 pieces together to, uh, to make a pattern, to make a kite. But in this case, there's three that are uh, put together just, the, just in exactly the same way as you would do applique, except I used glue instead of uh, sewing. And I used... Um, um, the tissue paper cement for that, which I usually thin a little bit. And you can barely see it, but there's this really cool a checkerboard pattern that I put on the side of the kite that was also uh, pre-printed on tissue and fit in there just perfectly. So, so it's not the glue you're using, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> Mimi, <coughs> excuse me. That was a labo M joke, sorry. <clears throat> Nothing funny about tuberculosis. Um, the glue that you're using isn't just like rubber cement, or it's not the PVA glue, or what, what are you using for glue? Is it a no, um, um, I'm drawing a blank, but um, it's a glue that you paint on, and um, it's used for model airplane construction. And I have a bottle of it upstairs, but um, I typically thin it a little bit with um, just a paint thinner. And um, you can get it at any hobby store that sells uh, paints. Um, if you ask for a stick and tissue glue, and I'm still missing the name of it, but um, that's uh, that's the stuff that I used. Maybe what I could do is um, send it, send the name to you by email later. And does that work on your carbon fiber rods as well? That same stuff. Um, hmm. I I would use it for wood to paper, but I would not use it on carbon fiber. On carbon fiber, I would use a cement and. I have used um, Ambroid cement, which you might know the name of. Uh, Ambroid was taken off the market, but I still have uh, a tube of it myself, which uh, I kind of hoard. Um, what I found is similar to Ambroid is any kind of model cement. This is Tester's cement for metal and wood. And it's um, thin and lightweight and one of the ways you could test it is put a drop of yellow glue or white glue on a piece of paper. Put a drop, a similar size, uh, of the wood glue, um, cement, I'm sorry, next to it. And then when they dry, compare the size and compare the weight of the two. The cement is ultra thin. It's, it's like a little bit of shellac on the paper. And if you use a toothpick to apply it, you end up with a strong bond that is very, very thin. And that's really the, the goal there. So that's what I would use to bond carbon fiber to polyester, carbon fiber to, um, in, in the case of the um, a bat kite, it was uh, carbon fiber to paper. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. So I thought that this picture on the left was funny because the trophy is actually larger than the kite that I used to win the trophy. And um, uh, Charlie Sodich did these trophies. Third place was the largest one. Second place was smaller. And first place was the smallest trophy, uh, saying that smaller is better. And uh, that, so, so that's uh, 
uh, just uh, just hilarious to me. On the right hand side, I built a kite because I was going to a festival and it was in South America. I was expecting rain. So I built a Rakaku that's actually waterproof using Orcon. Orcon and carbon fiber. Um, it's uh, just, you know, think of it as a plastic kite. And I did the decorations in uh, a marker uh, on it myself by, uh, by tracing. So uh, Orcon. Um, a lot of people say, oh, that's a great kite. I'm going to make one of those. But then they don't realize there are three spars, two tension lines, and a three-point bridle with a long tail. And getting all that right, especially a three-point bridle, you know, it's not for a beginner who's never built a miniature kite before. So here I wanted to um, show you that I did a micro quad line kite. And my my wonder is whether I'm going to be able to show it to you. So I'm going to stop sharing for a second and then share this window. I built a tiny quad Oops. line. Let me stop that and then figure out how to share that window. I'm going to go back to present now, a window, choose that window. Uh, it might be this one. Can you guys see the micro quad line right now? Yep. Yes. Oh, excellent. So I'm going to click on play. I built a tiny quad line kite. The wingspan is 10 inches or about 25 centimeters, and it seems to fly fairly well. Okay, here we go. Good luck. Fly left, turn right, fly right. Fly up, turn left. Oh, turn right, turn right, there we go. Down. Okay, let me go back to sharing my presentation. And finding my presentation. Um, present the window. There we go. Back to this and share this. Um, any questions about what I just showed? That, I believe, is the smallest quad line kite ever built. It flies quad line. I had to build the handles myself because um, <laughs> I had to match the handles to the size of the kite in order to get it to turn. And uh, as you could see, I could uh, do some turns and fly with it. Uh, any questions or comments about that? I was very impressed. Yep, definitely impressive. I tried making a quad that was about four inches, and it was uncontrollable. <laughs> it was so small, it was just too twitchy. Is that Donna? Yep. Oh, excellent, excellent. Um, yep. That one's that one's ten inches. I thought that I could make one smaller, but I haven't been motivated to make anything <laughs> smaller than that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, mine flew, but not for long because it was very quickly uncontrollable at that size. Uh huh. So, Glenn, the next session starts in about three minutes. So, I'm going to jump over to there and get that guy going. Um, but this will stay open. You guys are welcome to hang back and chat or, or whatever, and it'll all close out and stop recording when when everybody leaves. Okay, because I haven't gotten to the building section yet. This is going to be quick because I'm <laughs> going to talk about a pair top kite, and this is a spineless kite. So you can probably see my slides right now. Here are the materials. It's just a piece of tissue paper. Notice that there's no spars. So I take a piece of tissue paper. I cut it up. <clears throat> add some mylar tails. Here is some and here tissue it is. paper. Two pieces of mylar tails. A pair of scissors. A couple of pieces of tape. And 
top right is a piece of thread. And right now what I'm doing is I'm cutting out a piece of the tissue paper. It doesn't, here is some tissue paper. Oh boy. Two pieces of mylar tails. Top right is a there we piece go. of thread. And right now what I'm doing is I'm cutting out a piece of the tissue paper. It doesn't matter whether it, the color is on the front or the back. And with that piece of tissue paper, I'm showing you that it's already folded in half. So what I'm gonna do is take my template, which is an inch and a half by three and a quarter inches, and draw an outline around that template to get a piece of tissue paper that's still folded in half and is then that size. So here I mark it, I remove the template, and I begin cutting. Notice that uh, on the right hand side are a couple of pieces of tape. We'll use those to tape on the tails and the flying line, which, which is thread. Which is pretty cool to so make a kite from just two I pieces of tape. Cut out the rectangle. And I'm going to show you again that that rectangle is already folded in half. There it is. So I'm going to take that and just round the top. Okay, start pretty high and round the top, the tip. Okay, so the side where my thumb is, is the folded side. And then I cut at a 45 degree angle to get the shape of my kite. So the kite ends up looking just like this. Now, it should be a tenth on the table. The fold should give it that uh, V shape. And what I'm going to do is take one of my pieces of tape and then on the back, which is the, um, the inside of the V, I'm going to uh, tape both of the tails onto the tape first so that I have uh, tape and tails both in my hand, both attached to the tape at once. And then once I've done that, I take the inside of the fold and put that tape onto the inside of the fold. Press it down, and there it is. There's the two tails, they're each two feet long, attached to the bottom corner of the kite. Now I turn it over. So this is gonna be the front of my kite, and now I take this second piece of tape. This workshop only requires two pieces of tape. Grab the thread, and with tape and thread, I take the tape and attach the thread to the tape. I usually attach it with twice so that it's easy. Then I'm going to tape that so that the thread is in the very center. And notice that the thread is above the kite and the tails are below the kite. And that thread mark, you know, where I'm going to attach it is about a thumb's width from the top. So there it is. There's my kite. There it is flying flying really above the camera. And here it is, that's the finished kite with the thread attached to the center about a thumb's width from the top. So it is very good in flight. Here it is flying like that. Nice steady flight. And one of the things that I like about it is that it is easily repeatable because um, it's kind of forgiving if uh, kids or even adults make mistakes. Um, it's a pretty forgiving design in that it will still fly even if they're a little bit off on some of the details. Um, let me ask you guys, should we stop here or should I continue with the doodle kite? Continue. Excellent. Um, the doodle kite it takes just a little bit longer to build, about 15 minutes. It's great for doodling with colored markers. That was my idea behind the kite and the name. And this is also an excellent flyer. So for this, you do need tissue, but this time we're gonna use broom bristles. Um, those are typically, I believe they're nylon. Most brooms have bristles that are about four and a half inches long and thread tails and some regular clear cellophane tape. Uh, so. The important part is to get the broom bristles before you try this project. Here are the broom bristles on the table, and I'll start the video. 
I use wrapping tissue. So here is a bunch of wrapping tissue and I've cut out a piece already, but here's my template. The template is two and a half inches by four inches. You notice that I've marked little red marks uh, an inch down from the top and then an inch over from the folded side in order to get the folded tissue paper. Now, this one's already colored, but you can use plain tissue and use markers to color it yourself. Next, what I'm going to do is um, take one of the spars and on the back of the kite, I'm going to create a spine using that spar. Now, I recommend just using regular cellophane tape, taking a one inch square and cutting it in half. And then at the top, put a piece of tape onto the spine, holding it in the very center. And then another piece of tape at the very bottom, leaving some of the uh, brush bristle um, extended and then just take that and cut it off with a scissor. That way you cut off the bottom instead of having to cut off top and bottom. Next, what you're going to do is uh, attach the spreader to the kite. So there it is with the spine in place. And the spreader needs to be a little bit short. So I'm going to show you that a couple of times. First, I take the spreader and I cut it about a half an inch short using my scissors. There we go. Parts flying everywhere. And I'm going to tape it into one corner first, but I'm pointing out that it's too short to reach the other corner. That's done on purpose. The reason is, is that's going to be what creates our dihedral. So I'm taking a piece of tape and I'm going to tape that one corner uh, right into the very corner. So that, uh, that spar goes all the way to the edge to the corner. Next, what I'm going to do is take another piece of tape and try to get this spar. Okay, see how it doesn't reach? I'm going to try to get this spar right into the other corner exactly. And then put a piece of tape on that. It would be much easier if I did this on the table. So once that's done, I'll show you that there's a gap between the paper and the spar. That's where my dihedral gets created, the curve or V-shape of the kite. Now, I've taken um, a piece of thread, and this is just a regular cheap uh, sewing thread, cotton thread, doesn't matter what you use, and I put a piece of tape on it, and then Right at the point where the two spars cross, I'm going to tape that in the center so that the thread is up and away from the kite. See how the thread goes up? Now I'm going to turn it over and I've already taken the four tails and attached them to a piece of tape. Again, the tape is um, about a half an inch um, tiny piece of tape. And then I tape those at the bottom in the very center. Here, let me show you. This step right here is important. I'm folding, I'm refolding the spine so that it has kind of a V-shape to it. And there it goes, it's done. So excellent in flight. Here it is in flight. <laughs> and um, here's my book that has 26 kite plans, including the pear top kite and the doodle kite. Uh, both plans are in there. Um, that's all that I have. Are there any questions? Hey, Glenn, I think um, at the very beginning you said something about resources, so maybe places to find the Jap tissue or, or um, campy or condenser paper, balsa wood, that kind of thing. Yeah, um, I have a indoor supplies right here, and let me see if I can get you to see this screen. 
Um, I'm going to choose this window. And this is called FAI Model Supply. And uh, there are other model suppliers that you can fi find online for uh, uh, balsa wood and tissue paper. Um, I looked around, and this one didn't have as much as I had hoped. A big category for them is they supply stripped rubber for you to make model airplanes. But um, uh, that's that's what I have right now. Any other questions? Yeah, Glenn, one, one other source that I'm aware of is uh, the old Peck Polymers um, company that did free flight models. I yeah. think it's wind, wind it up. I think it's wind dash it dash up. Um, maybe uh, people can find that. But anyway, they also have a lot of these supplies too, and they're good to deal with. That, that didn't work. Yeah. But... It, yeah. Or, or search for PEC polymers and it'll take you to that new website. Wind dash yeah. it dash up. I, you just yeah. need the yeah. dash in there. Correct. Um, yeah. Yep. There's a place in Berkeley that's called Mickey's paper company that does Japanese Mickey's paper. Also, let's see now called also the paper tree. Uh, their phone number is 510-845-9530. So if you're looking for Japanese papers, that is an excellent source. And here, tissue covering um, has the Japanese tissue that I like, as well as PEC tissue, which looks like it comes in more colors. This is Isaki tissue from Japan. Great. Anything else? That's it. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Very impressed by your four line, Glenn. Oh, thanks very much. <laughs>